Knox Country Podcast Edition. I've always been around great songwriters and artists my whole life. I'm Michael Knox. Welcome to my world. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Jason Aldean, and you are listening to my boy Michael Knox on Knox Country Podcast. Welcome to the Knox Country Syndicated Radio Show Podcast. I am here with David Lee Murphy, one of my favorite, if not the favorite, singer-songwriter in town. Hey, hey. I've known David a very long time, but I didn't get to, like, hang with you back in the day, you know, like back when your first album came out and things like that. But I was always a monster fan and always followed you around and... The old school CRSs would be out at Opryland Hotel, and I'd follow y'all around when you do the party crowd. Yeah, the party crowd <laughs> kind of <laughs> display out there where y'all would walk yeah. around and do your thing. So we were jamming, but we hung out. We hung out back in your publishing days when you were when you were working down at Warner Chapel. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd you well, y'all there. would come by and look for songs, yeah. and but you were writing such great stuff too. That that's when I was pulling up, man. In 1994, your first album came out. That out with a bang. And it was a gold record, but you had four top 40s. But the big one that changed everything for me, which was a huge influence on me, was Dust on a Bottle. Thanks. Yeah. I changed everything for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but that's still the top. I mean, when you look at the recurrent airplay of a song, that thing's still like in the top 50. Yeah. You know, what's really crazy, too, is like like you can go to way up in uh, northern Alberta and play at an Indian reservation. You can go down to Australia way down at the tip of australia you can go to europe you can go to south america and what's really crazy and it's it's hard like we we write songs every day and we go you know you always would dream of having a song that a whole bunch of people i always thought i I wanted a song like help me make it through the night if i could write for the good times or help me make it through the night or one of those songs and um songwriters just want to have a song that you know, somewhere leaves a little mark on something. That song's an anthem. Oh, dude, that song's a huge anthem. I mean, it, it changed my vision for getting into country music as a producer because before then, country music was a lot of steel guitar, a lot of cool stuff. Like, I mean, and there's nothing wrong with all that. You know, I, I just still get tarred the heck out of Drowns the Whiskey, you know, but... um, but <laughs> And, that, and that, that's good. That's but, a good thing. But but that brought a kind of a rock and roll aspect, the way those acoustics and things like that came off on that on that kind of cut, man. That, that, that brought a whole different kind of aggression, I think, to our format. I think part of that was I wrote that playing bar chords, you know. Yep. Those are bar chords on the acoustic, and um, most of the time people were playing open chords like D and A and G. And that was just jamming, you know, acoustic guitar bashing. I like how people play that song today like they wrote it and they weren't even born when it was number one. You know, God like, bless them. I'm <laughs> glad. <laughs> I'm glad. So 1994 is when your artist career started. And how long were you cutting records? When my artist career actually started back in the 80s, just nobody knew it. <laughs> <laughs> back in 94 is when you're out with a bang, uh, you know, um, came out the album that went gold. And then you had dust on a bottle and then you were nominated for, you know, top new male vocalist at the ACM Awards. So everything. You notice he said nominated. Yes. Which means you lost. <laughs> yeah. do, do you remember who I you were? It's got no pleasure to be nominated. <laughs> stuff is just Like you're nominated for a, a Grammy, which means you, you got second. Because <laughs> do you remember who you were up against? Yeah, I do. Um, and the guys are Brian White and Wade Hayes. And Brian White won, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was Asylum Records, and he had a he, he had, came out of the box too. Yeah, he did. He had a great run. So your second album came out, at, you know, for MCA Records, and and all that was coming out while the nominations and things like that were happening. You were at MCA for how many albums? Three, three albums, and that ain't when you decided to start writing for other people, did it? Or were you still doing the artist thing? You know, looking. No, for, I was. I was still doing. Um, I was still playing, but I wasn't really. Um, I had made a conscious decision at that point. I was like, okay, um, I'm just going to write songs and, you know, see what happens instead of, like, pursue another record deal. I mean, I had been approached um, after the MCA thing about going with uh, other labels. And um, I was just like, you know what? I, I was just, I was uh, kind of dis, disenchanted a little bit. And, uh, so I just started writing songs and just 
kind of regrouping, trying to figure out. I just didn't want to jump right back into a whole nother labeled kind of situation. Yeah. But back in the early 2000s, you you did release a single called Loco. I did. And man, I heard that. I, I, I know it was only like a top five, maybe top two, wasn't it? Yeah, I went to five yeah. for five weeks. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I was going <laughs> to say. I remember that song. At five for five it weeks. got played. I mean, it was played so much that year. It was crazy. That had to be the first sign that there's still more in the tank. Yeah, I was with an indie label here in town. We had radio really pulling for us. And I remember going to the ACMs, and um, I was running into buddies out there. I remember uh, running into Rascal Flats out there, and the guys, and they were going, David Lee, man, you're back. That's awesome. And, and you know, and I knew that we only printed, like, you know, 5,000 records. We <laughs> <laughs> But we stayed at – we were in the top ten for ten weeks. For Back in those days was, was pretty cool. I mean, they didn't really have a lot of, like – 20 plus week records you know it yeah. went up there and then it went away and um we got to number five and stayed there for five weeks and almost backed into number one <laughs> but we ran out of gas and uh everything above us i remember uh watching the charts and like everything above us was coming out and we were we thought the guys were like we might be able to back into number one but we lost our bullet too so me and you go back i'm a huge fan i'm a big superstitious guy so on every one of Jason's records, I cut a David Lee Murphy song except one album. And that's been our least selling album <laughs> of all of them. So I'm a huge superstitious cat. So you're probably safe getting a cut on all my stuff whenever we can do it. I'm a, I'll try as hard as I can. I, I don't know if you know this, but I've cut 14 of your songs. I didn't know that. Yeah, from Jason Aldean, Big Green Tractor, The Only Way I Know, Sweet Little Something, uh, I took it with me, uh, missed that girl, walk away, walking away, just passing through. I break everything I touch, Lonesome USA, and then Montgomery Gentry, that's just living, ain't no law against that. Frankie Ballard, um, get on down the road, Josh Thompson, way out here, a name in this town. Man. I tell you, I'm your biggest fan in this town. So I'm, I'm your biggest fan. It is kind of creepy. You better watch. I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> So I that's have awesome, to, man. That, I have that, to cut a David Lee Murphy song when I'm producing a project. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get. Just load up. I'm gonna load <laughs> up. Bring the truck. But and unload it over. Now here. we have a wrinkle in the problem. You got all these years. You know, 2011. You were second place again. You were a nominee for Songwriter of the Year at the ACM. <laughs> Yeah. At the ACM Awards, but <laughs> you might want to set that up a little bit better. And, <laughs> and then, yeah. and then the only way I know won me an ACM Award, you know, for Collaboration of the Year, which was an awesome time to be there and seeing them open the show with it that year and everything. I don't know. Were you at the awards that year? No, I didn't even know that uh, it was Collaboration of the Year. So I just learned that. Yeah, I, I, nobody I, sent me like one of those little records or you know where it says Collaboration of the. Yeah, yeah. What, what, I kept mine at my, mine's at my house. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you a picture of it and send it to you. But, uh, but now, after all this time, this year, you're nominated for a collaboration at, the, at, the, at the CMAs, 2018 CMAs. For you and Kenny Chesney, um, everything's going to be all right. Now, you and Kenny have had a very long relationship as yeah. well. I mean, he's cut a few of your songs as well. He has uh, going going way back. Well, actually, the, the first song he cut of mine was called "Just Not Today," and uh, and that was on. I can't remember the album that it was on, but in two thousand, uh, probably six, maybe two thousand six, he did uh, "Living in Fast Forward," hmm. and that thing just that was the first Kenny Chesney hit that I had, and. Uh, I remember hearing that song for the first time. I was at, I was playing at the Opry. I was doing a show at the Grand Ole Opry, and uh, one of the guys from the record company came in, and uh, he had Kenny's new album, and he said, have you heard your Kenny Chesney cut? And I go, no, and I knew he had cut Living in Fast Forward, and he goes, man, you want to go out and listen to it in my car? I go, hell yeah. <laughs> so we go out there, and, and he, played, he played Living in Fast Forward, and it, I, I, it knocked me out. Yeah, I, it was such a great cut. I go play it again. I made him play it to me like three or four times. But that's and that's probably my speakers, favorite Kenny Chesney song. His speakers have never been the same after that because I probably pushed them a little hard. But that's my favorite Chesney tune is "Living in Thanks. Fast Forward." I mean, we whenever we were looking for records, man, we would always say, "Man, I need a Living in Fast Forward." I need that. They they cut the heck out of it. 
This is David Lee Murphy. You're listening to Knox Country. Podcast. Do you remember the first cut you got by an outside artist? The most memorable one was Reba back in 80, like 3 or 84. Wow, that was before. That's when she still wore a rodeo buckle. (laughs) Yeah. What was that song? It's called Red Roses Won't Work Now. And uh, I came up with that idea when I was probably about 19. And uh, it was one of the first songs. I wrote it with Jimbo Henson. Yeah. And I... and. uh, my landlord had sold a house to Jimbo and his wife. They said, we need to get you hooked up with this guy, Jimbo Henson. He's written all these great songs. And I go, yeah, man. He wrote, he wrote Fancy Free and something else and a um, uh, bunch of Broken Trust and Brenda Lee. And, and I was like, yeah. So so I had this idea, Red Roses Won't Work Now. And um and I went over there and I played that chorus and he's like, wow. And then he just wrote the verses and Reba cut it. And uh, so that was the first song that I ever re- really remember, you know, that was like, wow. She was like female vocalist of the year that year. So so have you only, I mean, was this something that you knew you wanted to do from day one or did you kind of fall into the whole songwriting artist? No, I... I, I I started whenever I started coming to Nashville. I was like 19, and uh, I lived. I was from Southern Illinois, which is like three-hour drive. So I would drive down here, and the first time that I recorded anything, I cut some demos out of Bradley's barn. And uh, a friend of mine, whose dad was a old country songwriter, he uh, he just called Harold Bradley out of the blue. And said, man, I want you to listen to these songs. And and, uh, so we went down to Bradley's barn. Harold Bradley was basically the producer. And uh, so we went out there and cut three songs. And we took them around on those seven and a half IPS tapes, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Really fun. That's great. I mean, I remember there was still uh, props on the wall from uh, Loretta Lynn doing the Coal Miner's Daughter movie. And yeah. then Bradley's barn burnt, you know, years, yeah, yeah. a few years later. So when did the record deal come into play? I mean, were you, you know, were you looking for a deal? Were you doing some independent stuff and they heard it? Yeah, I had uh, I had been passed on by everybody in town like two or three times. Like we had tried to get a deal early on. Like I went, whenever I was young, like they didn't want to sign young guys. You had to be 40. You had to look like Waylon or Willie or Merle. I mean, you had to have some wrinkles and scars and, you know, <laughs> your heart about to stop, you know, because those guys live that way, you know. And, um, I mean, everybody's like, yeah, man, it's like, bring bring us some, some more songs, you know. You know, you get a little older and, you know, so. But, like, what I was doing was probably um, a little edgier country-wise than what they were ready for at the time. Um it was four piece band sounding, you know, rock and country stuff and it just wasn't ready. You know, they weren't ready for that. And uh, you know, as time went on, um, uh, I guess I just fit in the program a little better. Yeah. Now, what was the soundtrack? Uh eight seconds. Eight seconds. Yeah, yeah. And, and what was the song you had Just Once. Yeah, because that's the first thing jason brought up to me when we were looking early on when he was wanting to be an artist you know and we were at warner chapel whatever first thing he brought up was that that movie and that song and he goes man i love that and then i remember i called you and got you to write with him i remember and, and, and y'all that wrote was a, that, that song. was his developmental deal yeah wasn't yeah, it yeah. i mean he wasn't no he wasn't even signed yeah we had lost a deal <laughs> we had already lost one deal well no i think you got me i think you we got we got going with him before you lost the deal. I think the song that I that I helped him write lost the deal for. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was trying to remember the positive way. I was trying I'm to teasing. remember. I'm teasing. <laughs> no, no, but uh, but y'all, and then but then he started singing that one. That was one of the ones in his final showcase, and uh, you know what that he was doing. But yeah, that that was his first lock, and that's how I got introduced to you. Is is just through that eight second soundtrack, and then when your album came out, um, I think your first first single was my first single was just once. Then yep. it was fish ain't biting. Yep, yep. And then it was party crowd. Yeah. Now party crowd, 
That was like that was like forever at number one. Yeah, well, no, it went to number two. Did it not? Did it really? <laughs> but it was the most played song of the year. That's what I'm saying. It was the most played song. Then, then that's what I'm talking about. Number two ain't bad. Huh? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I'll but that you. thing was on the charts forever. Yeah. That really? That was not that floor. No, it me. went. It was. Uh, it barely missed going number one, but uh, it was the R and R most played song. Well, yeah, that that's that's so that's whatever. like the number one song. I'll take well, that. Back then, yeah, R- no R- back then R and R was a chart. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't count like that. Like we had to say on, on our uh, then, like we had a couple of songs that went number one on other charts, and then those charts are gone now. So I'm starting to question you though, because like your songs are like losing deals, closing charts. <laughs> You know, it's yeah. like, do yeah. you know, but with you, it's the opposite. Yeah. You know, he's actually good luck for you. I got more label heads fired with Jason. <laughs> <laughs> every, every time somebody would offer him a deal, they'd get fired. Yeah. Keith Stegall, Mark Mark Wright, yeah. Tony Brown. Every time they, somebody offered him a deal, they got fired. Yeah. You Y'all know? like the angel of death to some of these people. It's just what we do. <laughs> well, you just, I mean, that it, it's the nature of the business. You just, you got to be crazy enough to get in at the first place to think you can do this for a living but then you just have to accept the fact that there's going to be a lot of trial and tribulation and you just got to take it you just got to be able to live through it so man you're you're sitting here you've gotten all these number ones as a songwriter you got the end all these artists want to be david lee murphy (laughs) you know all these guys cut your songs you go to number one parties you know huge awards everything and then you go hey man i'm thinking about being an artist again and going on a radio tour you know what made you do all that again it's fun yeah it's fun do you enjoy you enjoy it i do i'm leaving i'm leaving here tomorrow and um i'm going somewhere like Jackson, Mississippi, mm-hmm. and then I'm going to Memphis, and then I'm coming home and doing laundry, and I'm headed to Fort Worth, and then to San Antonio. But those I'm playing Fort Worth at Billy Bob's in San Antonio. I'm playing down in uh, Hilotus, Texas. But it's fun, man. I mean, I love it. I get I travel around, and it's not really it's not a radio tour um, per se because when you're a new artist, you go to radio and you visit and you introduce yourself. Um, this is, it's really fun for me to go because I can sit there and play a whole bunch of songs and, and do my songs and then do new songs and, and it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. Yeah. It's a pleasure. I mean, I love going to cities and just, I love going to the cool little restaurant and I like shutting down the cool bars and, (laughs) you know, and just, and then people come out and, uh, I'm sitting with a handful of people somewhere playing music and they might call out go play uh, big green tractor play only way i know you know and uh, it's fun it really it's it's a blast i mean we get in music to play and see people smile and be happy and have fun oh they've got to love you coming to town and doing like a radio setup show because i mean it's like it's david lee murphy well a lot of times it, it'll be me and two or three other guys and we'll, we'll it'll be a guitar pool mm-hmm you know, and that that's really fun because you can just get up there and you can play the song just just the way you wrote it, and talk about. Well, I was at my farm down there in Nashville one night on my tractor riding along, and I started singing this little thing like, "Take you for a ride on my big green tractor," you know, and talk about that. And then that, and then they go back out in the car and they listen to Big Green Tractor, and it's like you think about it. Oh in a different yeah, way. I remember that. Mm-hmm. Oh, so. Yeah. So, but the original time you went through it was a whole different way of introducing yourself, like you said. Now, this time you feel like it's more on your own terms. You can kind of mentally approach it in a way where it's like, hey, man, I'm one of the guys already. I'm just coming back and doing a, you know, remembering oh, situation. Yeah. I'm, oh, it's totally different. It's totally, totally different. Yeah. And because I remember Michael Tyler told me he did one of those guitar pulls with you that y'all were doing some radio yeah. together and he says it's so funny because he sent me a picture of all the other writers filming you singing <laughs> <It's true. laughs> and it was awesome because i'm like and he goes they weren't filming they weren't filming me you know and, and it was funny because because you're he's the really guy. good he does a great job too uh, he he's he's really good. But it's funny how he was like, they're all filming you. All the other writers are in awe of you being there. So it's got to be a cool moment for you, man, because it's kind of like now it's on your own terms. You can do it the way you, you can do it at your own pace now. 
and it's it really is man it is fun it's fun to go to different towns i mean you go to milwaukee go to boston you go to richmond virginia you go to roanoke virginia you go to um you know anywhere denver how about the how about the crowds are the crowds different i mean but is it a different look now is it young and it's and people that love i mean not to sound like cliche but i mean people love music people love country music but it's funny because people come up to me and go man i remember standing out in the front seat of my car in my dad's truck driving down the road listening to party crowd or dust on the bottle and guys now like you know that's what i've noticed when i've seen videos of of your shows now it's it's every age group and yeah, everyone is. is singing along and having a blast it's really fun yeah, I mean, I, I'm literally having a blast. I'm having a ball. And like Kenny, I've done some stadium dates with Kenny in, um, this summer. That was the Trip Around the Sun tour that, that they just wrapped up. And it's like we would be in some stadium. Like I was watching a football game yesterday. It was MetLife Stadium in New York. We played there a few weeks ago. And uh, just watching the football game, it's like, man, we played right there in that stadium. <laughs> and it was packed. You know, we come out there, and, and when we do, everything's going to be all right, and everybody's singing along, like all 60,000 people are singing, everything's going to be all right, and our arms are going back and forth. I was like, holy shit. Oh, excuse oh, my language. No. <laughs> <laughs> Knox Country Podcast Edition. <laughs> Some of you know me as a record producer for acts like Jason Aldean and Thomas Rhett. Others know me as the son of rock and roll legend Buddy Knox, party doll fame, back in 1957. I'm Michael Knox. Welcome to my world. You're listening to Knox Country. Hey, this is Keith Urban. What's up, y'all? It's your boys here, Florida Georgia Line. Hey, this is Little Big Town. And you're listening to Knox Country. You've entered Knox Country. Welcome back to the Knox Country Podcast. I love how you're so in awe of that, and I don't think you realize how many people are in awe of you. And even just, I, I think your persona is bigger than you now. I mean, it's like, you know, David Lee Murphy, you know, the legend. <laughs> I don't know is about like, that. I don't know about no, that. No, it's true. Because you're the one, you're, you're the example that people use that they want to be, and you're still relevant. You know, uh, the, the only thing I can use, I, I cut a thing on Hank Jr. one time. And I remember forgetting I was in the studio with Hank Jr. And I remember pushing the button, talking to Adam Schoenfeld, my guitar player, and said, man, do me like a Hank Jr. lick here. <laughs> and then Adam joked back going, well, it would be a Hank Jr. lick. And it, it hit me. And you're that guy that is current. You're a guy who we always sit here going, man, we need a David Lee Murphy thing. And you're here, you're relevant. And that's what's so so in awe about all this is that, like I said, man, I'm, I'm your biggest fan and you're still number one and you've been a part of my entire career you know so far so that's that's awesome that and and that, that that's what floors me and it makes me proud to be a part of it yeah you've had a huge impact on my career well just song wise i mean just impact. me me trying to emulate you so if you want to say it that way that's great but all we do is try not to mess up your demo <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a pretty good job <laughs> So now, how is how is your wife now with this new, or, or not new, but you know what? She's awesome. Is this like a new break for her, getting you out of she's the house? I was going to say, is she I loving? Gosh, she's like, <laughs> uh, aren't you getting ready to go out on the road again? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's uh, she she loves it, man. I mean, and it, and it it's fun because even back whenever I was on the road, as much as I was on the road, it kind of keeps your relationship, you know, fresh when you when you're gone for a little bit and you come back and you know. It's great. Well, and, and, and the kids, they they didn't get to see you be that, that dude. And now their dad has a number one hit. You're kind of popular again in their situation, in their deal. So is it cool for them? Is it is it neat for them to kind of see the resurgence of all this? Yeah, I think it's fun. They, they came to Nashville to the Kenny show when we played at uh, where the Titans play out there. And um, I think it was cool. I think it was cool for them to go out there and. You know, because now they're, you know, they're old enough to be out there and go, wow, man, there's like 60,000 people here, you know. But whenever they were kids, I don't, th I mean, we don't really talk about it at home that much. Like when I come in, I remember uh, telling a story when Jesse, my oldest son, um, he was like, you know, maybe 10 years old or something like that. And we, we had just once came out and the Out With A Bang album was out. 
and I remember I was living in Ashland City and there was a little kid down the street and his mom had my CD or my cassette. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. She had the cassette. And uh, she asked Jesse, says, your dad, uh, uh, haven't, uh, would you get your dad to sign uh, my cassette for me? And uh, and Jesse goes, I, I don't know if he's got a, a cassette or whatever. And she goes, no, I've got a cassette. And would you take it down take it down to your house and have him sign it for me? And he goes, yeah. And he, I heard his screen door slam in the back. We lived in this little two-bedroom, ten-roof house in Ashland City. And he goes, Dad, have you got an album out? And I go, yeah. <laughs> he goes, so-and-so's mom down there wanted to know if you'd sign uh, her album. I go, yeah, I'll sign it. So they he were didn't oblivious. Even know. He, he didn't was even oblivious. Know. Yeah. So they didn't know how cool you were. Or care. <laughs> <laughs> Do they now know how cool you are? I, I don't I don't I don't think I don't think uh You're just your dead. kids ever think that about your parents. <laughs> you, that's just who they are. So so what is I mean this is obviously you know, you're like you got so much more that you're fixing to do. I mean, what do you see is coming up? What do you see is next? What do you see is fixing to come down the pipe? Man, I never speculate. That's my rule is just take every uh, one as they come because uh, then you don't kind of hype it. But we're just going to play. We're gonna, we got a new song out there right now called I Won't Be Sorry, which is like, uh, I don't know. My, my new thing is this is the one that you learn to play air guitar. If you don't know how to play air guitar yet, this is the one you need to, <laughs> to learn because it's, it's like an air guitar little rocker. And uh, I don't, there's not a whole lot that sounds like that. There's not a lot of things that sound like it on the radio right now. So it's a little bit different. And, uh, you know, hopefully it'll catch on. But we're just, uh, we got our new record out there, no zip code. And um, that's pretty much, I'm, I'm just out there playing. And um, I'm going to do a little um, tour this fall with Jake. How's that going to be when? When you leave the stage, how's that going to affect well, Jake? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, I, I'm sure he's going to be all right. <laughs> I'm just, I'm happy. At, we're we're going to have a ball. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just. Uh, Has he ever cut any of your stuff before? Oh, yeah, you got a big, a big Jake Owen song yeah. anywhere with you. There yeah. it is. So I won't be able to do that one in my show. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but I mean, th- that's the fun thing about uh, our shows, our live shows nowadays, because we can do, you know, my older things. You know, party crowd, dust on the ball out with a bang loco, all that stuff. And then we can do uh, Big Green Tractor and Only Way I Know and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, you and, have monster hits. And they're fun. They're <laughs> fun to, to the do. the table, yeah. You know, so um, like just going to uh, a show and we do our stuff and then we get to throw a bunch of those hits from some other guys in there and it and it's a fun night when you were doing that when you got away from being you know the artist for those years and you were just writing a lot did, did you like getting in the room with the new artist or was it oh, more yeah, man. or were I, you enjoying I, the the writer aspect uh did i did i like getting in the room with the other with the new artist yeah, yeah. oh yeah i like it um i still do because uh i know how it was whenever i was coming up and uh there there's a lot of there's a lot of things that that you don't know about that you think you know about and you know hopefully like i can shed some sort of light on things for guys you know that that are coming along and just make it easier on them you know when you're writing have you ever sat across the room from a new artist that real early on in their career and just knew it was going to happen for them and then a couple of years down the road these guys are huge i mean have you ever have you ever really kind of seen that first yeah yeah yeah, like Luke. I mean, uh, actually, uh, Jason. You know, I thought Jason. I, in fact, I remember Jason playing me uh, his demo of Hicktown. Yeah. And I was like, hey, I think that's going to be a hit. I mean, it sounded like a hit. And then you wrote a lot early with Luke as well, you said? Well, I, I, I wrote with Luke. Luke had a deal. I mean, he was a new artist, and I wrote with Luke, but he hadn't really busted out, you know. But, uh, yeah, man, there's been a bunch of guys over the years that I've written with. and um, Just uh, Josh Thompson was another one. 
I, I, I thought he was really really talented guy still, you, you know, just by the songs he's written lately. Yeah. I love him. And, yeah, and he's uh, kind of finding gosh. his second win, too. Yeah, man. He's Well, he's a talented writer, and he's he's an, he's an artist. And uh, those guys, uh, they've got all the potential to, um, you know, do whatever they want to do. And everything just works out in its own way. So who's your um, who's your big go to kind of calls when you have ideas that you're really working on, you know, songwriter wise? Man, there's so many guys that um, that I write with. I write with uh, Rodney Clawson. I write with Shane Miner. I write with uh, uh, Chris Stevens, his new guy. Um, Matt Dragstrom. I write with him. Um, Jimmy Yeary. Uh, guys are just so many. I mean, there's a bunch of guys that I yeah. write with. So you don't have like one little team you you kind of spread it around yeah i do i mean i don't just i don't like just write constantly with one person but that's the artist in you i think you know because some of the best the best songwriters in town are artists you know not necessarily artist artists but they're artists at what they do i mean jim collins i've written a a bunch with jim collins and there's ben hayslett with ben he's next yeah but yeah he's coming in right after you ben um and i write a lot and it's just guys like that I, I feel like um, that I've got a lot in common with, you know. Yeah. You know, people I've got things in common with. And we sit around and drink coffee and talk about football, baseball, uh, basketball, hunting, fishing. Loving every day. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Ah, shit, I got credit for that song. Yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Shalacy. Check us out on the web at KnoxCountry360.com or on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at KnoxCountry360. How long have you and uh, Doug Kasmus been working together? Oh man, known since each other? the 80s. Since the 80s. How did that relationship develop? Because he's still with you to this day. Yeah. I mean, he's. Man- I've got the same. Was- I've got the same manager. I've got the same agent. I don't make a lot of changes. <laughs> when you're you you're a self published yeah. writer too. Well know. what Which happened I was, think is a horrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> Have you always been like that? Have you always Yeah, pretty much. That's amazing though. Well what happened was the way I met Doug was uh I was going to SIU, Southern Illinois University, and uh I heard about this music class, which was basically you take a three hour bus ride down to Nashville you party all the way down here. You go in and you meet uh, some publishing and tour some studios, and you get three music hours out of it. And um, I thought, well, that's a pretty good way to get three hours of uh, you know music credit, which I needed. And uh, but I was coming. I had already been down to Nashville and cut the songs with uh, Harold Bradley, and I was coming anyway. So I thought, well, this is this is a good uh, excuse for me to just find out a little bit more about what i need to find out so the uh the last project you had to do something for the class and my thing was i wrote three songs for the class and uh, the uh th- there was a couple of guys that were going to judge your class project and the night that i was going to do my class project a guy by the name of joe sullivan who was partners with charlie daniels and they had a company called sound 70 in nashville and joe couldn't make it that night and doug worked for joe and so doug came out and filled in for joe sullivan that night and i played my three songs and he said uh i think you ought to be an artist and i was like "Ah, i just want to be a songwriter which i really want to be an artist i was sandbagging i was sandbagging just those little bitty things changed your whole path him not showing up and doug filling in for him yeah did doug look like moses back then no he looked like uh (laughs) Some some other character, <laughs> but he didn't have the Moses vibe going in. I mean, y'all relationship has lasted a lot longer than yeah. a lot of marriages. Well, you know, um, in the music business, you find people that you trust and that you work with, and and you know that they got your best interest. Mm-hmm. And there's you know there's just all kind of nightmare stories about different people being you know whatever. But uh, Doug was working with Charlie uh, and Charlie's company. And uh, at the time, and so I feel like I, I've got a little attachment. Uh, my roots go back to Charlie Daniels, so um, I've got that little sentimental attachment to Charlie. 
But then there was Charlie and there was Dickie Betts and all those guys out of that company that I got to know those guys, uh, you know. So I got to ride with Dickie and, you know, th those were like things growing up, you know, in your early 20s when you get to ride with Dickie Betts and, you know, ride with guys like Warren Haynes and, you know, yeah. stuff like that that just like builds that little little layers of whatever that is and just to explain i mean doug is kind of like your manager in a sense oh yeah yeah for sure you know yeah. and that's a lot of things you don't see a lot of that in nashville you see it in publishers but you don't necessarily see the this songwriter manager you know but you were doing that from day one and yeah. and that's what benefited you because like i said you're, you're you were more of an artist approach to how you wrote songs you know and that's the biggest compliment somebody can give you is when an artist cuts your songs they're trying to be you and that's what's so cool about it well i think everybody just wants to try to write you just want to try to write a song like i want to write a song like i would do it and i think the writers that really um are successful in town they write something and you can hear it and you go oh yeah that's that's how i want to cut it well how are you with this new generation you know you it's kind of hard to get in a writer's room these days without three or four people, you know. I mean, I mean, does that does that affect your approach? No, I mean, I wrote a song with uh, two other guys today, and um, no, it's. I mean, a, a lot of my songs uh, I either wrote by myself or with another person, but then I've got two or three, uh, you know, that two that I'll, I'll have written with two or three guys too, you know. Yeah. And the, but, uh, and, and the new track generation, do you, does I that, like it. Yeah. yeah that's it's what I was going to ask. I mean, that, does that inspire you? It, it does. I mean, sometimes, uh, sometimes I'd rather just sit down with a guitar and a notebook or, you know, sit around. I mean, now you can play into your cell phone and, you know, come up with ideas, but I like, I like writing with track people. Um, I like, going in the studio and cutting songs it just it all varies i mean i just yeah so your your approach is and i hope i i pat myself on the back i'm still a fan at what i do you know and it sounds like you are a big fan of just everything you're doing which i think is what sets you apart from a lot of people because sometimes they they get caught up in the business of it and they and they don't stay a fan of what they what they're really getting to do. I mean, do do you feel that? I'm just lucky I get to do something that I love to do, and I'm a terrible businessman. <laughs> I'm terrible. I'm a terrible businessman. Well, but I, don't I, know. I do like to play. I like playing music. I like writing music, and that's that's all I'm about. That's all I care about is writing. It's like I'll get a day off. Like they'll say, okay, you got two days off, and I'll go. I can't sit still for like I gotta go. I'll, I'll end up, you know, calling one of my buddies. Going, what are you doing? You want to write? You know. I mean, well, I would just it it floors me, and it amazes me how big your career is. And I'm not just saying this because of Michael works for a publishing company, but I mean that you and Casmus and your you know your family, your team have sort of contained everything. Um, you know, you're not affiliated with huge publishing companies like to pull strings and get you in here get you in this camp you just kind of do it you know or people are drawn to you well it's not that i wouldn't it's not that i wouldn't um it's just that i've done it this way so long i'm scared to change it yeah you and know? i get that i, I, I mean I i've done that. it i've done it i mean there there's a lot of i mean i'd like to work with you and someday, oh, don't I, tell know, him that. someday He's be I know you. someday i know we're going to work on some sort of project together yeah but i'm just scared to change my my thing because mm -hmm. it's it's just what i've done it's like we're like uh, a backyard race car team like we build dirt cars in the backyard and we go race them somewhere yeah. it's like we we got motors hanging from chains and you know, we're I mean, mom and pop, you know. Yeah. But that's the charm of why you're successful. Mm -hmm. is we don't even have an office. <laughs> I mean, that's what, I mean, y'all have done so much. And, Do you, yeah. If you want one, I can help you yeah. with this, just so you know. <laughs> but, I mean, that's what's so amazing, that you guys have, have done it like that for so long and haven't been sucked into thinking you have to change. Or you have to, you know, join, you know, these big companies in order to be successful. You're kind of doing it your own way. Yeah. You know, and, and sort of like this this whole new uh, endeavor about, you know, getting back into the artist um, thing. You're kind of like, okay, I want to do it. 
So let's do it. Yeah, I, I mean, the most important thing is just write the best song I can write, and if if I can't if I can't do that, you know, it's just do the best you can do. But that's awesome. I mean, I was introduced to you 24 years ago, and 24 years later, you're still the coolest dude I know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and that's awesome, you know. And um, but, dude, I I love you being here. I know you got stuff to do. It's and my I, pleasure. I appreciate you coming here and hanging out. It's my pleasure. You know, this is more like me, German, no somebody way, that man. I'm a fan I'm, of. I'm, I'm so, I'm so thankful uh, of all the songs of mine that you've cut on Jason and uh, Josh and Frankie and uh, Montgomery Gentry and so much, so many um, that I'm a fan of yours. So it's it's my pleasure to be here. Well, if you ever want to give me something extra. <laughs> 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 I got I got one for Jason's new album. <laughs> Don't open I, the door. I only get thirty percent of that gift. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. He already admitted he's not good at business. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, dude, I love you being here. Thank you again. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Knox Country. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Knox Country Podcast. Special thanks go out to co-host Mr. Lacey Griffin and producer Donnie Walker. See you next time. You've entered Knox Country Outtakes. We're back with David Lee Murphy. And we haven't burned anything yet. <laughs> Police haven't shown up. <laughs> yet. 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 <laughs> you got a band, the same guys yeah. on the road with you, or is it more acoustic shows? No, it's, uh, it's um, I'll show you a picture of us a couple weeks ago. What's well, on radio? The picture don't matter. Did you tell him yet that there's no radio show that you just wanted to talk with him for an hour? <laughs> <laughs> and then do one the same way, just say Knox Country. <clears throat> Knox Country. This is David Lee Murphy. You're listening to Knox Country. <laughs> <laughs> Are you new? Well, no. What they do is like sometimes they go, no, just say that. And mm-hmm. they're going to cut. They're going to. Sp- I'm yeah. analog. I got to get the whole okay. line. I don't, I, I don't crop no time. sentences. I know. <laughs> yeah. I'll never win it. <laughs> I'll never win it. <laughs> hey, this is David Lee Murphy. This song I wrote with Ben Hayslip and Jimmy Yeary. It's called Only Way I Know. No, I take that back. That was just me and Ben. Me do that <laughs> Screw Jimmy. That would be awesome. Uh, that would do that be again. Awesome. No, no. Say it again. Uh, you guys got it down, man. This is good. Hey. Nah, let's don't put that. That sounds like uh, freaky. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything, but you topped Shane. I just want to say. You know. that's, that's kind of freaky. <laughs> Let's try it again. Knox Country. Podcast edition.